verses 21 through 24, and, and I promise you we're going to do everything we can to get through uh, this text. You might have to listen a little bit fast, but I promise if you listen fast, we'll be done before they start serving breakfast at the Hardee's. So if you would, here we look here, you've got on the board or you've got your Bible. Uh, it says there, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled. It said Abraham believed and it was accounted unto him righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you here tonight, Father, we just simply ask that you would open up this word, that you would have this word to become alive to us here tonight, that you would have this word applied to our lives. And Father, wherever it is, maybe that we are contending where we are not exactly on your path, where we are fighting the Word of God. Father, I ask that here tonight that we would give that to you and that through that we will be justified in you. For it's in your name we ask and humbly pray. Amen. So as we look here, it says, uh, Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Now, as we look at this, we, we've got to go back because uh, we are pretty much in a Pauline type of uh, church era where uh, everything from roughly uh, 15, uh, 18, I believe it was, uh, from that time until even today, that uh, the vast majority of people, they would call themselves New Testament Christians. Great. Amen. But that doesn't mean that we get rid of the Old Testament, that we unhitch from the Old Testament. But also we find that from that time, uh, primarily in, in the, the church uh, that is, has been reformed away from the Catholic Church, uh, we find that we uh, pretty much uh, a lot of times rely on Paul. So as we look at Paul, uh, we automatically in our minds should go uh, to Galatians and, and see that, uh, that it, it that it's by grace of God. It says, he says in Ephesians, by grace are you saved, not by works, lest any man could boast. But as we look at this, what we find is uh, that James and Peter, or uh, James and Paul, were talking about the same thing. We've already talked about uh, many a time in here uh, where Paul is getting to it from one side, which is, uh, if you have faith, then you'll have works. And uh, we find James saying, uh, well, your faith and your works show that you are a child of God, that you are uh, a Christian. And you see, that's both sides of the exact same piece of baloney. That's both sides of the same, uh, what is that thing, meatloaf. We all should like meatloaf to an extent. Now, I guarantee you there's some that don't. Uh, but we find here that, that it is abrasive as James is saying this. Uh, he has said uh, just before this, he said, faith without works is dead. It's dead faith. It's, it's useless faith. It's vain faith. But we find here him going a little bit further. And now we find him just like his brother uh, giving an example of what he's talking about when he says faith without works is dead. He says that in verse uh, 17, we find it again uh, in verse 18. You, you have faith and I have works. I'll show you my faith without. You show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. And we go a little bit down to verse 20. We, this is right there, same paragraph, same cynic structure. He says, but you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead. 
So he's given this, this punch in the mouth of saying, you can say you have faith, but if you don't have anything to show for it, it's vain. It's fake. It's not real. You're a hypocrite. Uh, you're a vile sinner. But I'll show you that my faith is true uh, because my faith will be shown through the works that I have. You'll find if you'll look in your Bible, I believe uh, it's in John. It, we may get there here in just a little bit. Uh, but as we look, we find that Jesus said they shall be known by their fruit. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, we all remember uh, the, the most used verse in the Bible today in today's society. Now, oh, oh, yeah, that's John 3.16. No, that's not the one they use. They say, you can't judge me. You ever heard that one? But Jesus says they'll be known by their fruit. So what does that mean? We are to be fruit inspectors. We see what is going on in their lives, and that gives us a good clue of who they are and who they belong to. But as we look here, we find uh, that James is going, he says, but uh, was not Abraham our father? So we look there, we're talking about Father Abraham. This is the, the one that we find that, uh, that he was, uh, he believed in God and it was accounted unto him righteousness. This is our father, the father of the faith. Uh, for them, it would be the father of Judaism, so to speak. Uh, though it's sort of funny because uh, Abraham was not a Jew. You ever thought about that one? Abraham was from the land of Ur. Roughly the same area of either Iraq or uh, Yemen. He would then go into Haran, uh, which it was today modern-day Saudi Arabia, would stay there for many years before his dad died, and then he would come into the promised land. But he wouldn't be there long because uh, there would be a, a famine in the land, so he would go down into Egypt, he would get in sin, he'd come back, uh, he got right with God again, and then after that we find that uh, his, uh, his nephew leaves the family, leaves the pack, and uh, later he would go again, he'd do it again, and and he'd get back in sin, and he'd come back again. And we find this is something that goes on in his life. But here, we all can identify, as James says, with Abraham. Yes, yeah, sure, this is, he's talking to the church of Jerusalem. So 99% uh, of the church was probably Jewish. But we all can be identified in Abraham. He says, was not Abraham our father justified by works? So as we look at that, we know works means what he did. Well, we look at the word justified there, and this is a word we've, we've not looked at as we, we look here. What do we find? It, it means, this word uh, means that uh, was he not found just by what he did? Was he not found innocent? Was he not found holy? Was he not found free from the bondage? Was he not found righteous before God? Now, how did that happen? Did that just happen because he was in Haran, or he was in Ur, or he went over to Shechem, and there he, uh, he heard the voice of God, and he got down on his knees, and he, he asked God to forgive him of his sins, and, and then he lived a life just the way he chose. Is that the way, is that the works that uh, we find Abraham doing? Or was it that he heard the call of God? He believed God. And in that belief, he put feet to his belief. I would dare by say here tonight as we, we begin to look at this, that to be justified by works, that, that means to be found just before God, to be found innocent or holy before God. What we must do is we must do what God has called us to do. We look and we find, I'm going to look at uh, primarily at the next two verses, and we're going to look at these and probably go into the house. If, if, 
uh, if everybody listens fast. So we look there, it says, uh, but, uh, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac on the altar? Now, we look at that, and that is, a, that is an illusion to, or an allusion to uh, that of Genesis 22. Now, as we look, Genesis 22, what do we know about it? We know that, that God called to him and said, I want you to take Isaac, your son, your only son, and I want you to take him to a place I'm going to show you. I want you to then offer him as a sacrifice to me. Now, as we look at that, what do we know? We Because uh, all of us should have been uh, went to children's church. All of us should know this story. If you've been in church any length of time, you know this uh, because it's probably been preached at least 50 times in your lifetime. Uh, and what we find is uh, that he, he takes his son uh, the very next day, that night probably, the next day they set off to do what God has called him to do. And, and in doing this, he takes the wood, he takes the fire, and they go off uh, to Mount Moriah. Now, why does Mount Moriah matter? Mount Moriah is the place of the school. It's the place of Golgotha. It's the highest spot on uh, the Jerusalem uh, area. Now, as we look at that, what do we find? Well, uh, we find there with that something that uh, you'll, if you read any of... Uh, your commentaries, you're going to find two different views on what I'm about to say. Now, both are biblical, but one uh, may be a little more biblical than the other simply because of what James says. So let's look at what James says again right there. He says, uh, when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar, did Isaac die? On that altar. Answer is what? No, he didn't die. Well, how could he offer him? You know, shouldn't he have died if he, was, if he was a sacrifice, if he was an offering? Shouldn't he have died right there? And if he didn't, then, but God said he must offer him, but, 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 uh, but he didn't die. How can that be? Well, it is because he was faithful to do the work that God called him to do. And as he put him on that altar, he was offering him to God. We look at that. That word offered right there means to take up. He took him up to the top of Mount Moriah. It meant that he, that he bore or he brought him to the place where he was supposed to be. And in looking at that, what does it say? It says that he, he tied him up. And uh, we all look in our little uh, Bible stories and we, uh, we imagine a child, probably an 8, 19 year old kid. No, th that's not what Isaac was. Isaac was a man in his 30s by this point, if you look in context. But we see there Abraham taking him to where he's supposed to be. And we find him bringing him to the place that God told him to be. What is that place? Well, if it is an offering, then it had to be a place of an altar. It was a place that brought sustainment. If you'll look back in your Bible, you'll find Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 21, that unto Adam also he gave a, a coat of clothes that he would be covered. What does that mean? Something had to die. So from the very beginning, from, from that point that, that we, that sin was brought into this world, it was shown from that exact point that something had to die for our sin. There we find, as James so eloquently puts, that Abraham was willing, ready, able, and did offer his only son in whom he loved. He offered him to God. Let me ask you a question right now. What are you not offering God that God has called you to offer him? 
What is it that you are harboring for yourself? Instead of saying, Lord, here it is. I'm bearing this even to you. Lord, this isn't comfortable. Lord, this, is, this doesn't even feel right, but I'm doing it anyway because I'm going to be found obedient. And in my obedience, I'm going to find that I am justified by this work of giving this to you. The altar was a place of sacrifice. What does that mean? That means it was a place of slaying. Something had to die on the altar. When we bring our sin unto the Lord, when we bring ourself unto God, when we show Him by that work of saying, Lord, I'm going to be obedient to you, something has to die. Of course, we find, if we'll look, I believe it's in Corinthians, where, uh, where uh, Paul says, I have to die daily. I have to die daily. Daily. Oh Lord, how many times should we do that ourselves? You know, we were having our uh, young adult meeting this past Sunday night, and as we were there, uh, we, we came to a conclusion. The conclusion was that uh, my missus wakes God up every morning because she gets up at 4 o'clock. And that uh, Keith uh, walks with him every morning about 6 o'clock just to get him ready for the rest of us that, that, that may not be stirring about that time. You know, I say that in jest, but, but honestly, what, when is your time with the Lord? On that daily basis. Now, if we're looking at, at Paul, he said, I die daily. On that daily basis with God, where are you dying daily to Christ? Where are you being offered? We find in that that, uh, that the altar was a place of incense. Can you look in your Bible? You'll find uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. And there it says that, that the altar of incense is before the throne of God. And it is a place where our prayers are heard by God. So, so what does that mean? So as we go to that altar of God, when we come to the front or we're uh, maybe at our steering wheel or we're in the bed getting ready to get out of bed or we've just read our Bible or whatever the course may be, and we go before God, we are going before Him and that prayer is a sweet savor unto the Lord. See, that's a place of prayer. a place where we are humbly submitted to him that's a place where we are in the presence of god as as we find there in uh, revelation 8 that that the, that the our prayers are at the throne of god so what does that mean when we are on our knees or we have bowed our hearts before god and we are truly praying that means you are in the presence of god really does remind me of uh first kings 18 we, we all know first kings 18 where uh there's a, a challenge on where you've got the prophets of baal and you got the one prophet of god in elijah and uh, over here these bell worshipers are hooping and hollering and they're cutting themselves and they're they're ladling their blood to try to get their god to to listen to to answer them and and we'll find there and you may not even look at it and realize what's going on there but in bell worship they believe bell was a god that would go off from far journeys that explains why we find elijah say well holler a little bit louder maybe he's on a far journey maybe he's in the bathroom and when all that was over then he said you've had your time And he calls the children of God, he calls Israel to reform the altar. He didn't take one stone, he didn't take two, he took twelve. Why twelve? There are twelve tribes. 
was bringing the family back together. You know what prayer does a lot of times? It will bring your family back together. And that happens on the altar. And what, what do we find with that? We, well, we find that if you look at that, and uh, we can go a little bit further, and you've got another illusion there in the tabernacle or in the temple, uh, before you could even get into the tabernacle or the temple, there was this big, about uh, uh, five foot by five foot by about three and a half foot tall brazen altar. And upon that, before you could enter, something had to die. It had to die for your purity. It had to die to... To, for your sin to be recognized with that so that you can get closer to God. You've got people outside these doors, even tonight, that do not know Christ. How do I know that? Because the studies show in this county alone, and in that county, and in that county, that all three of them alone, only one in ten people go to church on a regular basis. What does it tell me? Let's take Donaldsonville, because how many of us live or around or are in Donaldsonville on a regular basis, right? In Donaldsonville, the last uh, census said there were about 2,200 people in Donaldsonville. What does that mean? We'll divide that by 10. Only 200, give or take, have a desire to be in the house of God. And without desire, that pretty much shows that they do not have the word. That means roughly 2,000 people every day in this immediate area either A, don't know God, or B, are backslidden and don't care about God. But you see, this altar in being a place of death, that so what we find is in our purity, in, our, in the presence of God, in our cleansing in God, we find that that happens for us at the cross. Not at the Walmart. Not in a Christmas present that we gave somebody. Not in a, a party. Not in a sport. Not a job. But the altar is found in Christ Jesus and Him crucified. So what does that mean? Well, well as we look at this, we find when, uh, when He offered Isaac on the altar, He was offering him in His faithfulness. Guarantee He didn't want to. I don't know that because God said, I know this is the child you love. But he was found faithful. He was found faithful to offer his son. What is it in your life that you know that you need to offer before God, to let die upon an altar? What is it that you have right now that you are struggling with that right this very minute... You don't think you can be found faithful? I know it's hard. I know it's a struggle. How do you know that, preacher? Because I deal with the same things you do. But in both cases, mine and yours, just as with Abraham, just, with, just as with Christ, we must offer that for a, before a heavenly Father because we are found faithful. You see, uh, we must be found faithful or we must be faithful even when it hurts. You know, one thing I would say in the church today one thing I would say is that we don't want to hurt enough. The Western church has gotten comfortable 
How do I know that? Look at this nation. Look at Western culture. I was reading a, uh, an article uh, from Barn, I believe it was, uh, that just came out yesterday, and here's what it said. You ready? By the year 2060, by the year 2060, only roughly, I believe it was, 2 billion of the people on this earth will claim any religious affiliation. That in that, uh, what they are, they are shown by the trends is that roughly, I believe it was 80% of them will not be in America. Brothers and sisters, sir, ma'am, let me tell you right now that, that our lack of faithfulness is hurting us more than the hurt that we might feel if we are faithful. We must be faithful even when it hurts. We must be faithful even if it makes us feel awkward. How many of you are willing on a daily basis to simply ask somebody, do you know Christ? Sit down with them say, uh, and if they say yes, sit down with them and say, well, tell me about uh, your, uh, your experience. Tell me about your life. Let me hear about what God has done in you. Found this out the other day that, uh, that there was this, uh, this rumor going around that I'd heard. Uh, and uh, so I went to check to make sure it was true before I said anything. Turned out that it was not true. Somebody had painted somebody in a corner and they made them say something they didn't want to say. How many times is that us? How many times, on the contrary, do we not say anything at all? And we're not found faithful. Let me tell you who is faithful. I want to give this to you, and we'll, we'll probably be done for the night because we didn't listen fast enough. Darn, you know what I mean? But we'll, we'll look real fast at something that, that too many times we forget. You see, Abraham was justified because of his faithfulness to do the work that he was called to do. And when we are not justified, or when we do not do the work that we are called to do, then that means we're in sin. We'll get there later where it says that uh, for those who know to do good and do the not it is sin. But let me show you something right now. If you are uh, maybe convicted by the fact that you're not being as faithful as you should, or that you're not offering something that you should, or you're not at that altar on an active basis, let me, let me help you out a little bit right here. It says right there. If we confess our sin, he is, he is faithful and just, same word, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, here tonight, maybe there is a place that, that we're not being as faithful as we should. Let me tell you who is faithful. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He's more, been more faithful to you and me than we ever could be to him. So what does that mean? That means that we go to him. See, when we go to him... That is a work of faith. It's a work of purity. It's a work of humbleness as we seek to be sustained by him. That he is faithful and he is just to forgive.
here tonight, what are you struggling with? Here tonight, where do you need Christ? Preacher, I've been saved since I was nine years old. Great. But what are you doing with it today? See, Abraham didn't stop on Mount Moriah. Abraham continued to be faithful. Abraham didn't stop when he got down to the bottom of Mount Moriah. But he continued to be faithful. Where do you need to be justified? You're not going to be justified just because you wish it. But you're justified by the works, the fruit, the evidence that you are a child of the King. Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you right here, right now. Father, our hearts are humbled as they are bowed before you. Lord, I don't know what the struggle is with each and every individual. But you do and they do. Father, right now, I simply ask that you have convicted us of something. Something has popped in our head. And that something is your holy presence. As we seek you. Here right now, Father, whatever that is, find us confessing that to you. Find us dying or being offered on that altar right now. That we might find that peace that we're looking for. That we may be found pure in your sight. And Lord, I ask these things in your holy sweet name I pray. Amen.